I'm coming to you from my house and I am, I'm chuckling a little bit because I've tried to get this on, on video a couple times and finally my wife and I decided it would be best if she took our kids on a long drive. <laughs> <laughs> Parents, I'm feeling you. Uh, this is an interesting time. Uh, but seriously, this is an interesting time for all of us. And I was supposed to, I was on the calendar to preach from Hebrews 8. We're in the middle of a series called Greater. And oh, Hebrews 8 is amazing. And it's all about the greater covenant. And it really is amazing. And I cannot wait to share with you. But I called Pastor Tim and I said, you know, with where we are with coronavirus, my heart is in another place for our people and uh, for our church. And so I, I, I want to talk about emotions. Is that okay? And he said, yeah, talk about it. So I, I know that the coronavirus is causing us all to feel different emotions, right? I, we have been texting as a staff. We've been texting and calling and Zoom chatting and Google hangouting. Um, and there is a word that keeps surfacing, I think, for all of us. That word is unsettled. I think a lot of us are unsettled. Whatever that means for you, I think there's different meanings for that. But settled, you know, it's normal. It's peaceful. We know what to expect. That is anything but right now. It is an unsettling time. And we have heard people that are unsettled through isolation and being lonely We've heard of people being unsettled in the sense that they're frustrated. We're just angry that we've kind of lost control of our decision-making process, right? Some, some decisions are being made for us, and that is frustrating. And I think for some of us, we are feeling anxious and worried. And can I even say it just straight up, just afraid, just fear. And I wanted to talk about that. I've, I'm, I've been fascinated with emotions and, and I've been trying to analyze emotions a little bit this week and diving into that. And what it forced me to do was actually to remember the very, very first time that I was afraid, the first time that I can, that I remember real fear. Um, I was seven years old. I grew up in Moscow, Idaho. What up? Uh, what's up all the Vandals? Vandals fans? I'm not a Vandals fan. Um, but... I grew up there, so if they do well one year, I can cheer for them. <laughs> the Kibbe Dome, that's where they played. Oh, Eric's Cafe. Moscow, Idaho is the home of Eric's Cafe. I don't know if it exists anymore, but when I was growing up, the best strawberry milkshakes, the best milkshakes anyway. I will fight you on that fact, okay? you. Oh, no, I know this other place that has better milkshakes. It doesn't. Eric's Cafe did, okay? Um, you got two. You got the big metal huge thing along with the glass with the whipped cream right also the home of moscow church of the nazarene so that's where i grew up for my first 12 years of my life that was my home church my dad was the associate pastor there i am a pk a pastor's kid so i know that probably answers a lot of questions so i'm so weird uh, but my dad was the the music pastor there associate pastor he had all the different names music minister uh, song leader <laughs> way back when but um he would he would work late often and so i would i would be there with him i lived at the church i loved being there so we had just built when i was 7 years old we had just built a huge huge dome a new sanctuary and it was dome shaped for me like i remember it being as big as the king dome in seattle right it, probably wasn't that big but for me it was just enormous I actually even got to put shingles on top like as we were building it and I was tied my I, there was a rope around my waist and it was tied to the cross in the middle there's probably a great sermon analogy there but here's where here's where this this first uh, feeling of fear came from okay so one of my favorite things when my dad was working late and I had the entire church to myself uh, there, there was a cart that we would use to move like risers or boxes or whatever, just a normal cart, uh, pretty, you know, but it had the four wheels on it and I would lay on that with my back and then I would push myself, right? Like, like a, there's a squid. Uh, no, I'd push myself on that. And what I was doing is Superman was, was 
like the pinnacle back in the day. So I was, I was imagining I was Superman and I was flying, right? So the ground was the, the sky and the ceiling was the floor. So everything was flipped up, upside down. And I remember I would go everywhere in the church. The new sanctuary had a middle aisle that was angled like this. So one push and you'd go all the way down to the, you know, just hands out, just Superman. But sometimes the wheel would get a little weird and you'd veer off into a pew. I probably have a few scars up there in my head. But, um, okay, so one night I was in the old sanctuary and the old sanctuary pitched steeple. I always pretended I was flying over a ravine uh, there or like a canyon or something, but it was all wood and there were wood arches. And I remember I was there uh, late enough one night to where it was, it was dark outside, completely dark. Not late enough to where you would question my dad's parenting. I just want to throw that out there. But, but late enough that it was dark. And uh, I, all of a sudden, I had stopped for some reason. But I heard the lights were, were off. I don't know what I was thinking. But the lights were off and I heard a creak. That changed everything. Okay? My flying days were over. <laughs> I, I went in one second to just absolute joy, right? I was imagining flying all over the universe to, to here in a creek and, and just sprinting to my dad's office. I, I, I honestly, I don't think I flew ever, ever again. I told that story to my wife and she was like, I wonder what other people thought, you know, if somebody else was watching you, this weird seven-year-old boy on a cart in the dark, just going around a church. <laughs> so pretty, maybe I'm glad that, that, that I didn't do that anymore. But as I've, as I thought about that story and as I have retold that story, one of the things I caught myself saying was that sound made me scared. That sound made me scared, right? Uh, that's, that, that was the equation in my head. I heard a sound and I got scared. So I, I want to talk to you about this. I think this is the, this is the, I'm about to get super high tech here. I made a diagram. But uh, in all seriousness, if you haven't analyzed emotions very much, a lot of us think, and I used to think, oh, we hear or see something, and that makes us feel something, and then we act on that feeling. Does that make sense? Right? Um, I've read Crucial Conversations, and... Uh, there is, uh, this is an incredible book. My wife really uh, just devoured this book for work. But once we got into it, I mean, we were talking about this a lot. And they, uh, the researchers and the authors in here would suggest something different that I want to get to. Um, because here's why this is such a big deal and why we understand this. We are going through so much right now. And we're not hearing a creak uh, in the in, in an old sanctuary, we are hearing and seeing everything related to coronavirus, and if you examine uh, our responses, they are across the board. We have so many different emotions as as a church, as a state, as a country, as a world. Literally, everybody's been affected by this in some way, shape, or form. We have all been affected by this, and it's causing different emotions. And I. It, it, it really is, I'm thinking about, I mean, if you're a senior in high school or college, your high school or college career just ended abruptly, right? You've got to have some emotions about that, right? Parents, we usually get a little bit of time to, to anticipate and to think about how we're going to keep our kids busy this summer. It's just on us right now. Single parents, you have a completely different dynamic. My sister happens to be a single parent. This is, she is feeling different emotions than, than I am because of this. I'm thinking about hourly, people that work hourly. You may or may not have a job right now. You may or may be looking for something different because you have to provide for yourself and your family. I, small business owners, I don't even know what you're thinking. I, I Honestly, I can only imagine because... You are, you're having to deal with the livelihood of your family and possibly even employees that you have. Senior adults, that's a completely different emotion. I'm feeling emotions from my parents. They're in their 70s, you know? I'm, I'm 
there, there's a different emotion there. Kids, I think even our kids are picking up on some things. Even if they're really young, they know that something's not right. My seven-year-old is so stinking social, and he, he, can't, he just wants to be at school. He wants to be with his friends. We're all experiencing emotions. So my question is, what emotions are you feeling? And now, let me, let me bring this, a new diagram to you, okay? This is what crucial conversations will say. We hear or see something, and then we tell ourselves a story, right? We hear or we see something, coronavirus, and now we tell ourselves a story. Then we feel emotions, and then we act on those emotions. This may be a new dynamic or a new paradigm that you're they're wanting to think about right now. But think about your emotions right now and, and ask yourself, where are they coming from? And is there a story behind them? Is there a story behind them of why I'm feeling this way? And I guess my next question is, if, we are, if, if emotions really do come from a story, is there any way to tell a different story? so that we can feel a different emotion? I think there is. And not only crucial conversations, but scripture has something to say about that too. God has something to say about that. Uh, if you have your Bible, I would love if you'd go grab it, to pause this or something and, and go grab it, uh, or get your phone out and get your Bible app out. But there are a lot of places that we could go to in scripture and um, if, you, if you read the Gospels, the accounts of Jesus, when Jesus is dealing with fear, a lot of times he just says, don't be afraid, fear not. He might say it like that, fear not, don't be afraid. It's all over scripture. You know, so the question is, Jesus, what does that look like? How do you not be afraid? I want to focus on a guy named Paul, Paul the Apostle. I think he is a living example of what it's like to be able to control your emotion. So let's go here. Uh, I, there's a little bit of a backstory that I want to talk about with Paul, because here's the thing. Paul used to be a Pharisee. So he was a religious leader. Uh, he may have been born around the same time as Jesus. Uh, so they may be close to the same age. And he is a Jew. And because he is a Pharisee, he has learned, uh, I mean, he knows the Old Covenant. He knows this is the, the, the Sinai Covenant. In fact, this gets a little bit into Hebrews 8, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Because that's the thing. Jesus is coming to say, I, I, I am the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. Look to me for life. Don't look to the Old Covenant for life. Look for me. Look to me. Okay? That's not sitting well with a lot of the Pharisees and, and a lot of the Jewish leaders. This is something that they have, they have given their life to this old covenant. So Paul is one of those. And he is persecuting people that are following Jesus. They're probably not called Christians yet, but let's call them Christians because uh, that's what we know. So he's persecuting Christians. His, he is hearing and seeing Jesus. The story telling, he's telling himself is this guy's crazy and he's trying to... to He's trying to disrupt everything. And so uh, I feel angry about that, and I'm going to act on it by persecuting Christians. So now he's on the road to Damascus. This is after um, Jesus has been, uh, Jesus has, has died and he has resurrected. But Paul is still not a believer. But he's going to Damascus to persecute Christians. And he hears and sees something. He encounters uh, God. <laughs> and it changes his story completely. Now his story is Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. We have to follow Jesus. I mean, in an instant. I don't know if it was in an instant, but man, he changes his story completely. He has different emotions and he acts on that. How does he act on that? He cannot stop sharing the good news of Jesus, this story. He is going all over the place. And these churches are starting wherever he goes. One of those churches is the church in Philippi. And that is, that's the book of Philippians that we're going to read. A little bit more on Paul. His actions are leading him to being persecuted now. So he was persecuting, now he's being persecuted. He is being imprisoned. He is being beaten. He is going hungry. He is poor. So basically what I'm trying to say is, Paul has every excuse to feel any emotion that he wants to feel, right? Right? 
Paul has any excuse to feel any emotion that we're feeling right now. In fact, he's writing this letter to the Philippians from prison. From prison, right? I'm not trying to make light of our situation here, but technically, he is, uh, he is experiencing forced social distancing. <laughs> okay? That's what's happening. He is being forced to socially distance himself. Well... Go to the end of Philippians, chapter 4. It's a very short book. You could read this a few times this week. Uh, But at the end of chapter 4, here is something that Paul says to this church in Philippi who's also experiencing persecution, and he's writing this from prison. Again, I just want to make that clear. And this is what he says, halfway through verse 11. You ready? I know the experience of being in need. I, I, I started a little late. I said I would start halfway through verse 11, and it's kind of key that I do. Let's edit this out. Let's go back. You ready? For I have learned how to be content in any circumstance. I want to read that again. For I have learned how to be content in any circumstance. I know the experience of being in need and of having more than enough. I have learned the secret to being content in any and every circumstance, whether full or hungry, or whether having plenty or being poor. What's the secret, Paul? He is writing this from prison, and he is telling them, I have learned to be content in any circumstance. Okay, this is the thing. Crucial Conversations says, if you want to control your story, if you want to be the master of your story, you want to tell a different story, you've got to work backwards. So let me pull this diagram back out. So let's start here. Okay, if you're a Jesus follower, I've got to say this. If you're a Jesus follower, Jesus boiled this down to to basically one thing said in two different ways. If you follow me and you want to keep my commands, love God and love others. Love God and love others. So if we are acting, if our behaviors are anything that's not an expression of love, if it's anything else other than an expression of love, we've got to rethink some things. We've got to move to step two. If you're wondering, I think an easy way, there's a barometer, there's a measurement right here. Well, how do I know if my actions are? Oh, well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Oh, social media, self-control. I think about that one a lot. If our behaviors are anything else other than those, and really, I think love, I think the rest of those are just expressions of love. Then move to step two, okay? This is what Paul says. Move back a little bit in chapter four, okay? We're going to be in chapter four, verses five through eight, basically. But he does this. Paul actually works backward for us, okay? I think this is incredible. Uh, Verse five, let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. Examine your behaviors. If you're not being gentle with other people, if you're not loving other people, move to step two. What's step two? Examine your feelings. Examine your feelings. And crucial conversations would even say talk about your feelings. Dialogue about your feelings. Or you go to a psychiatrist. This is exactly what they would tell you probably. How do you feel? What are you feeling? Talk to me about those. I've been working on my... I'm not trying to make fun of psychiatrists. Um, How do you feel about that? Uh, But seriously, I'm going to make a a statement. It might be a stereotypical statement. Because I think maybe women struggle with this, some too. But guys, we struggle with this. We struggle with this. I don't know if this is just cultural relativism where, where we feel the pressure to not feel emotions, that we can't cry or that we can't... Yeah, be emotional. I, I'll be just very vulnerable and honest with you guys right now. And I don't even care. I have cried at every single Pixar film. We just watched Big Hero 6 with Baymax. I sobbed at the end. Baymax sacrifices himself to get Hero and the other girl out of the vortex. You know, I am sobbing, sobbing. <laughs> My son even looked over and he's like, is this okay to cry? And I said, yeah, it's okay to cry. He started crying. My wife is crying. Taya was, you know, playing with a dog or something. <laughs> but we were all crying. It is okay to do this. Talk about your emotions. Um, if you can't find somebody to talk about them with, Paul has a suggestion in verse 6. You ready? 
Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all of your requests to God in your prayers. The simplest way I can talk about prayer is that it is talking with God. That's the easiest way to explain it, talking with God. And notice, don't be anxious. Anxious is that emotion. I think you can put a lot of, of different emotions in that blank, in that space right there. And, and, and Paul is not saying you can't be anxious. You can't be afraid. You can't be angry. I think he's saying don't live in this. Don't live in this. If your actions are not loving, there might be something behind that. So what is it? Don't be anxious about anything, but rather bring up all of your requests to God and prayers and petitions along with giving thanksgiving and giving thanks. There's something that, that happens at the end of this that is crucial before we get to the next step with our stories. He says in verse 7, he writes this, Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. That's key. In 2005, I used to live, I lived in Nampa. I was going to NNU and um, in 2005, some things changed and uh, I ended up in Nashville. I thought I was going to be in Nashville for six to eight months. I was going to pursue a music career and my wife, my, my girlfriend at the time ended up moving. Then we got married and we started a life there. We, ended, we were there for 11 years and uh, we had just purchased our first house. I was valeting. Uh, I was a valet at Opryland Hotel, and that's what you did if you wanted to work on your music career. You needed flexible hours, so you could either be a server or a valet. And I was a valet because uh, my other roommates, right when I got to Nashville, they were valets. So I had ended up, my music career had taken a turn. I had actually really received a pretty vivid call from God that I, that I needed to pursue the church. And in, in that uh, waiting period of trying to figure out what, to ha- what was going to happen next, I was volunteering at our church, but I was getting good. I was making decent money as a valet. I was the manager of the Magnolia side while the VIPs came in. And 2008, I don't know if you remember what was happening then, but the recession and everything was kind of stopping. Well, uh, it was a normal day. Thursday morning, I showed up to work. And by 9.30, I didn't have a job. I got fired. And I took it well, I think. Uh, asked a couple questions. And there were some circumstances. And I, I didn't think that it was just at all. But I drove home and I got to my house. I was kind of numb to the whole thing, really. And I remember being in our little bay window. And, my, and I called my wife. And she called me back on her lunch break. And I told her. And I just sobbed. I just was crying. And I was telling myself all these stories. Um, I'm not good enough. I'm not valuable. I'm not going to be able to provide for my family. It was tight back then. It was really tight. Um, Didn't know how we were going to, you know, thinking through, I just, I don't have a job. I don't know what I'm going to do. I I don't have any other prospects. What's happening? When my wife came home, uh, the tears broke open again. And she sat down with me, and the very first thing we did was pray. And when we got done with that prayer, and I'm telling you, this was a real honest, this was like a David prayer in the Psalms, where you just, you just bear everything, and you're vulnerable with God, and you don't mince words, you just go for it. And by the time I was done, I'm telling you, the peace of God, it set in. It set in. And then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds safe. My mind was able to take information in. And Jamie started telling me about all the good things in our lives. And, and she got to this one point. She even, she even said our vows over to me again. She said, you know, hey, in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer. <laughs> I said that we would do this together for richer or poor, poor. We get a chance to, to do this. And uh, I was able to add some things to my story. Here's the thing. When we get into these crisis modes, when we get into something that disrupts our normal, oftentimes we allow our current situation to define our entire story. Right? Right? We're, we're dealing with that right now. The coronavirus has affected all of us in some way, shape, or form. 
there is the ability that it's kind of almost human nature for us to allow the current situation to redefine our entire story. But Paul has something to say about that too. Paul, Paul says, after you've prayed about it and you're in a place where you can, you've dealt with your emotions, he says in verse 8, From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. A lot of theologians think that um, this is a lot. Some theologians, I don't want to say that, but some theologians, and I happen to agree with them, think that this, this letter from Paul is a little bit different than the rest of his letters in the sense that it's not necessarily uh, linear. It's not as cohesive as some of his other letters, but that he has a lot of great ideas and thoughts, but they all center around chapter 2, verse 6 through 11 verses 6 through 11. And, and it's, it's interesting. Verses 6 through 11 is written differently. It's written in poem form. And let me read it to you. This is Paul basically recounting the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus and what happens after that. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus, He did not consider being equal with God something to exploit, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven and on earth and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is what I think Paul does. No matter what Paul is seeing or hearing, no matter his situation, he reminds himself of the story of Jesus the story that eclipses all stories, the story above all stories. He doesn't allow his current situation to redefine his whole story. He lets Jesus, he lets the story of Jesus define his emotions and his actions. He lets the story of Jesus dictate his emotions and his actions. I can't say that enough. Paul lets the story of Jesus dictate his emotions and his actions. That's huge for us right now. That is why we are Christ followers. If you signed up to be a Christian because you expected no pain and no problems anymore, that's just not a fact. That's not, that's not what's going to happen. If you look through all throughout scripture, the Israelites, <laughs> are you kidding me? They know pain and they know problems all over the place. Every single person in scripture goes through this. What we have Instead of fear, instead of anxious, instead of isolated, we have a God who's with us. And we have a God who knows these struggles more so than we'll ever know. So I, I just, I want to say that again. Paul allows the story of Jesus to dictate his emotions and behaviors. If we're Jesus followers, our stories, the stories that we tell ourselves should always lead to love. Jesus, again, he boiled it down. Love God, love others. The stories that we tell ourselves should lead us to love. If I think receiving it and showing it. So if you're isolated, if you're feeling lonely, don't let your emotions keep you from the love of God. Reach out. Please reach out. Let somebody know. Be vulnerable, but let it lead you to love. Pray, pray, pray. God is with you. God is with you. I know these these are really interesting times. But let it lead to love. If you're frustrated, if you're angry, it is really difficult to receive and show love. I would challenge you to reshape your story, to to analyze your behaviors, to think about those behaviors, to think about these emotions that you're feeling, and then tell yourself this different story. Jesus and Paul had every reason to feel any sort of emotion. And Jesus, at his dying breath, he says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. He has every reason to feel these emotions, but he allows his story to lead him to love. My dad, he, he, uh, whenever he would drop us off at school when we were little, 
uh, or whenever we were leaving for the day when we could drive and we were leaving for the day, more than likely he would say this saying. Uh, it's, it's his saying. This will pro- I'll probably put this on his, his tombstone. That's a ways away, Dad. <laughs> I didn't mean to be morbid, okay? But also, social distance yourself. Don't be stubborn. Stay at home, okay? Um, but he, he used to say this all the time. Hey, have a, have a good day. You're going to go through it, so you might as well make it good. Have a good day. You're going to go through it, so you might as well make it good. Uh, he used to do uh, teen, teen choirs like at church. Like He would get all the youth group together, and we would learn songs, and we'd go on tours. And he would always say that <laughs> at the end of rehearsals, at the end of, of performances, hey, have a good day. Or if he wasn't going to see you for the week, have a good week. You're going to go through it, so you might as well make it good. <laughs> it challenged a lot of us to think differently because we're like, can you? Can you? In a, in a really weird way, and probably not weird because my dad thinks through everything that he says, he was saying what Paul is saying, what Paul is actually exemplifying it doesn't matter your situation or your story. You, you can tell yourself a different story because we have Jesus. Paul even says at the very beginning of Philippians, I'm torn between two desires because I could die right now and I could be with Jesus. But I know the bigger sacrifice is for me to stay and do the work of Jesus. I mean, how do you get to that point where in any circumstance you're okay with this? Um, I think it's just remembering the story of Jesus. Don't, don't let this current situation define your whole story. We, we serve a creative God. We were created by a creative God. My, my situation at the church, when I became the, the events coordinator, I, when I was fired, I asked my church, is there anything I could do? And they said, yeah, you could be an event monitor. And so that meant that I sat at a desk whenever they had an event for ten dollars an hour. They would they would I they would pay me ten dollars an hour to monitor the event. I was so grateful for that. Ultimately, that job led to a job at Trevecca Nazarene University that God completely had His hand in, which ultimately led me to Eagle Naz. So as I look back on it, you know, <laughs> I I would have never forced myself. Uh, to leave that job. I don't know that I, I don't know when I would have. Um, and I don't think that God made me, made my boss fire me, right? I think what happens is that when we get into these circumstances, we, we can seek God's will and we can open up, we can analyze our behaviors, we can, we can, we can think about our emotions and get those out to God. And then we can add the story of Jesus to our own and then we move from there. And that's what I want to challenge you to do. I don't think this is a self-help gimmick, right? This, this, this is really honestly where our faith gets put into action. Okay, and we, I, we are praying. We are praying for, for all of you. The staff is praying for all of you. If you have a prayer request, please get online. Let us know. Call somebody. Text somebody. Let us know. If you're not in a life group, we're doing Zoom chats all over the place. Um, this is a great time to, to, to get involved. And, um, and there's lots of ways to be creative in this time. And, and, that, and I really am praying for you. I know there's, again, there's a gamut of issues. There's just a wide array of, of things that we're dealing with. Allow God's story, allow Jesus's story to, to, to reshape uh, where we go from here. And, you know, I am, we're going to wrap it up here, and, and I'm the, the worship leader, and uh, I have been missing singing with you. And it's a little weird. I've asked a lot of people, you know, are you watching live streams, and are you singing with with the live streams. And everybody said, no, I'm not really singing. It's a little awkward. But we, luckily, I know I'm still social distancing, but I happen to live with one of the other worship leaders at our church. And so we're going to finish with a song, maybe a couple songs that, that really just speak to this idea of what do we do with our emotions and how we allow God to sing over us, the God, God's love to reshape our, the way that we think. And then, and then so that we can be hands and and feet, and we can, and our stories can lead us to love, right? So we're going to finish with that. But before that, I, I want to give you the benediction here, and it's from Philippians. 
uh, chapter 4, verse 8, and I'm going to read all the way through to 9 this time. So hear the word of the Lord. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Practice these things. Whatever you learned, received, heard, or saw in us. And here is what I really want to leave you with. And the God of peace will be with you. So, in the words of my dad, have a great week. You're going to go through it, so you might as well make it good. <laughs>